I think we can actually kick off um, so we can finish a bit early. All right, all right, all right. I'm here. All right. So, so, um, so I mean, I mean, we are starting the model chapter today, but the, the way I, I wanted to start this was kind of to go back to a picture that we were shown at the very beginning. Okay. Of the entire chapter. Um, and and I think one reason why I like this picture is for me it kind of forms like a structure to think through how to work through an entire data set itself. So so two things I want to drag out here. Number one is um, the idea of this picture is that whenever I'm going to any kind of project, uh, there are there are particular things that I, I should think about doing you know stepwise. First bit is obviously I have to impute my data, but I have to tidy it up, right? Tidying it up, there are, there are a number of things that we've learned on that, right? So we learned kind of how to, like how to walk through an entire walk, like the Rangu section itself, right? This, this kind of shows you a lot more about the tidying and the transforming of a particular data uh, itself. Um, and and I, I, think, I think it's quite important, uh, like when you're going through a project itself to think through, using each of these functionalities in a way to get your data to a stage where you can now define a model. I think it's going to be important when I get into like how they define a model in the book. So after you tidy, after you transform, uh, you can decide to visualize the data. Uh, but one of the things that the book was insisting on is uh, this visualization itself is part of like your entire, it's part of the process of data rather than just looking at it as under the communication part. So when you are visualizing, there are a number of things that will probably jump out at you. Example is if you are going through like a regression curve itself, there are a number of things that will probably jump out at you, apart from just looking at the equation uh, itself. Then you come to modeling, right? So the idea of the modeling is that you are now trying to represent whatever information that you have tidied, that you have transformed, that you have visualized, into like a, a family of models. And that's what the book was trying to communicate. You're trying to reduce all that into an equation, right? Where it's now easy for you to kind of walk through with that equation itself. And two big things that I jump out at you. One is, is a linear equation, this is a non-linear equation. And, and as soon as you get to a modeling part, those are like the first two things that will probably jump out at you, right? So, so I, I, when, I, when I was going through the chapter, I, I wanted to start with this. this this process itself, because it kind of gave me an idea for how to walk through a data science project. So let me go back to the model itself. Right. So, so the idea here is, so I mean, everything that is here is kind of what I just explained. Uh, let me go to modeling with model, right? So the way the book started was, trying to explain the goal of what a model represents. And, and I think I think if you've walked through a mathematical model, I think some of these things, you might not think about it explicitly, but you see this is what you're trying to do. The first bit is you're trying to provide a simple, low dimensional summary of a data set. So imagine a data set that has X columns, Y rows. All you're trying to do is, can I condense all that particular information into a quick summary, and that quick summary will be represented in like an equation itself, right? And uh, so the book continue and explain that we are going to use models in this, you know, to partition data into patterns and residuals. So, so this low dimension summary, what you are aiming for at the end is, is it possible for me to actually see a pattern in the information, like a way the information is kind of trending and residuals, so residuals will be like your, your error content itself. And I, I think this model part started off with like a regression thought process. And, and that's why that residual part is quite quite important. That whenever you're walking through a model, it is not going to be a complete representation of what your actual real life data set would be. But all you're trying to do is assume a case going that's that's what this chapter is trying to try to you know trying to explain. Um, so like they mentioned yet, yeah, so strong patterns will hide subtle trends 
Um, so we use a model here to kind of peel back the structure of uh, of a particular data set, right? Um, so, however, before we start using models, before we start using models on your data sets, you, you kind of need to understand the basic way of how a model works. And there are two basic ways um, for, for how a model kind of works, right? Um, the first bit is you will need to define a family of models. And, and what, what this means is essentially you are trying to construct an equation, right? You're trying to construct an equation that assumes what your real life case should be. Right. And you that equation, you're going to use algebraic terms, which is like your X and Y variables. Right. And when you do that, the idea of creating that assumed uh, process is you're you are you're trying to you're trying to get to what what is called a fitted model, right? So you're trying to make that assumed case to be as close enough to what your actual data set represents. So I, I think in statistics parlance, this is probably called like a testing data and like your, your main data itself, right? So you, essentially, when I have a data set, I'm trying to get some, some pool from that data set to kind of assume what that real data set would look like. I test a lot on that real data set and I use that to kind of fit into what my main data set is going to represent, right? But it's kind of important for us to understand that even this fitted model, when we get to the idea of the fitted model, is just a representation um, from what this family of models is going to look like. So at the end, um, uh, what you have right now is what a best case model would be, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the actual representation, but what the best case model would be. And that point is why this residual bit becomes quite important. And as, I guess as we go into the chapter itself, we'll probably see residuals play, play out quite a bit. Then it goes into um, some interesting connotations here. So A, George Box mentioned all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. <laughs> then uh, it's also quite useful to kind of read the, the full context of what this code represents. So I'll probably take some time to just read the quotes, because I, I think one of the things it's trying to drag out, especially for most of us that we're working through mathematical models is, I don't think you should kill yourself if you don't have a, a best represent, a, your best fit model itself, because your data set is just a sample representation of what you're actually trying to assume. So he said, now it would be very remarkable if any system existing in the real world could be exactly represented by any simple model. However, currently chosen parsimonious models often do provide remarkable useful approximations. This is where some are useful, you know, plays a big role. For example, uh, the, the, the physics law, PV is equals to RT, relating pressure, volume, and temperature of an ideal gas via a constant R is not exactly true for any real gas, right? But it frequently provides a useful approximation. And furthermore, its structure is informative since it springs from a physical view of the behavior of gas molecules. Now, for such a model, there is no need to ask the question, is the model true? If truth is meant to be the whole truth, the answer is always going to be no. The only question that is important is, is the model illuminating and is it useful? And I think that kind of takes us back to what these two parts of the model kind of represent. The two things that you're aiming for when you're trying to drag out a model from a data set, from a sample data set is, A, you are trying to define the family of models. You are trying to reduce things to an actual equation. You are not going to know the full extent of what that new data set is going to be, but can you get to a close enough representation of that data set itself, right? Then the second question is, uh, you, are, you, are, you are trying to generate a fitted model, right, from the family of, for, by finding the model from this family that is closest to your data. And I, and I think if, if, if the major question you are trying to answer when you are trying to create a model is, is the model illuminating and useful, then you are in a good place, right? So now let's now go into how our represents this entire thing. So the first bit is we are going to use the model our package, uh, which wraps around based out to work them naturally in a pipe. Right, so the same way we have been going over over and over in this uh, in this book, you create your library of tidy graphs, 
you create your library of model arrow, then you do this um, uh, this um, this function. So options any action equals to any one. Right. So now let's now walk through what a simple model kind of represents. So the book said we should take a look at a simulated data set, right? And it has two continuous variables, right? And this is quite important, right? Obviously important because we are trying to create a regression curve here, right? So two continuous variables, X and Y. So if we plot them to see how this is related, and this goes back to how I kind of started the chapter itself, the, the, the visualization bit of um, walking through a data set should not just be seen as a means of communication, but can also be seen as a means of actually modeling your data out itself. If you can actually see certain things, there are a lot more, a lot more judgment calls you can see. If I go into the rest of the book, the quick thing you can probably see here is even, even before I create an equation that represents this, I can easily see that there's some sort of trend that is kind of happening here, and it probably happens in a linear fashion. Now, not every dot in this in this graph probably tends towards that linear fashion itself, but in general, I can easily see that kind of approximation. And it goes back to what I said. The only question you should ask yourself is: Is this model illuminating and useful? And I can easily see some useful insights here before I create. Um, an equation itself, which is why it's kind of sometimes it's good to start with visualization. When you when you import your data, you transform it and you tidy it. Sometimes it's quite useful if you start with visualization before you kind of get into the proper the proper mathematical work itself. So he said you will see a strong pattern in this data. So similar to how I explained it, let's use a model to capture this pattern and make it quite explicit, right? So it is our job to supply the basic form of this model, and again. This goes back to what we are, the two objectives that we are trying to create here. So the reason why I'm trying to like reinforce this thought process is, so I, I, I work in finance and I do a lot of work. And uh, one of the quick um, pits you can probably get into is trying to get your financial projection to be as close as reality as possible. And I think one of the, one of the beauties of this chapter is kind of helping me take a, take a step back to understand that most models I'm going to create, either financial or any other kind of statistical model, um, there's a way I can think about it. If I just jump into it, aiming to get a, a, a perfect representation, I'm always going to miss the mark. But if I jump if I jump into that kind of model, thinking about three major things. Number one is that there are two parts to a model. Number two is this major question that a model should kind of answer. Uh, itself. So that's why I'm kind of going back to this beginning thought process because everything in this chapter kind of represents majorly kind of touches on what this is trying to talk about uh, itself. So let, let me just go back to where, where I got it from. So he said it's our job to create, to supply a basic form of this model, right? In this case, the, the relationship looks linear from the way we kind of define this graph itself. And let's try to create like an ascribed equation here. So simple linear equation, y is equals to um, uh, the intercept plus the gradient and a particular x variable, right? So we decided to call the intercept and the gradient here AO and A1, right? So let's try to get a feel for what models um, from that family equation will do by randomly generating a few and overlaying them on the data. Now, before I get into other parts of the book, I think one of the reasons why I, I like this example, and I'll probably get into it. one of the reasons why I like the example is um, the book decided to create a very scattered graph. Uh, but this in itself is actually quite illuminated because what it's trying to say is I have a family here, this linear equation. I'm trying to drag a thought process from that linear equation. So every line that I can see here is quite useful. It's just a basic graph. Right. So, so if you put this graph in front of anybody that probably doesn't understand this kind of process, it's very easy for them to want to dismiss this information set itself. But there's a lot of information you can actually generate from this graph itself. So how do we get this representation? What we decided to do is try to use geom AB line. So going back to visualization itself, which can take a slope and intercept as parameters, trying to ascribe, trying to visualize this linear this family of models that we have created here. 
Um, and later on, we'll probably see a bit more general techniques that you can apply on the model. So let's just run through what this code looks like. So A, I create a variable called models. I run it through a table, create a one and a two. This is just a way to create like a random variable. I think I put a comment here. So what I run it does is to determine a minimum or maximum number with a number of um, observations. So 250 represents the total number of observations. This is your minimum number, and this is your maximum number, right? So I run this, I run this through ggplot. Uh, so ggplot in one A, S, X, and Y. Um, run it through geom AB line. I, I set what my intercept looks like as A1, what the slope looks like as A2. Um, then data equals models. Uh, this is the data itself. Then alpha equals 104, right? Then I, I'm trying to create a point uh, itself. Right. So you can see it's scattered graph. Before I come back here, let me just run through what this explanation looks like. Um, so I, I guess I want to take a, a pause at this point. So uh, Mariana, before you joined, I was explaining to Adeyemi that I haven't actually finished this chapter itself. I think I have gotten to like 25% of the chapter. So I think our class today will probably finish a lot earlier. Uh, uh, and as soon as I get there, I think I, I, I ended up at visualization itself. Uh, which you know probably in the next fifteen percent itself uh, to kind of get there. So I anticipate that our our um, our class today will probably finish a, a lot a lot earlier today. Yeah, sure, uh, no worries. I'm totally fine with it. Thanks, thanks, fine. Um, so let me explain what this graph is like. So there are two hundred and fifty models that we have on this graph from this map from this number of observations, but a lot of it are really bad, right? We need to find good models to by making precise our intuition that a good model is close to the data. Now, this, this is like a perfect caveat to everything I've been saying before. So where, where I ended up saying that, the only question of interest is if your model illuminating and useful, the caveat here is it's best if you get to a close enough representation. So you probably shouldn't have a bad model and just assume that whatever you can generate from that bad model is good enough to use. It's, it's best if you get to that close enough representation itself. And that's the caveat that, that this is trying to give. So if we do that, if you can get to a good model, um, uh, or for us to get to this good model, we need to find a way to quantify the distance between the data and the model. Then we can fit the model by finding the values of AO and A1. So the way we created this simplified equation that we have up here, uh, that generates the model with the smallest distance from the data. Now, what this is trying to represent is the, the definition of what a good model will be. Let me take a step back here before I actually go into the rest of the book. If I run a quick straight line here, like an assumed straight line here, the way they are trying to define a good model is, can each of these points get close enough to that line itself? Um, and, and that kind of represents what a close enough to actual representation would be. And, and for, us to, for us to define a good model, they are trying to, a, we need to define that distance. So if I run a line here, what is the distance between this point and that actual line? And can I, is it possible that I can actually put a model where I can drag this down, where this point gets as close to the line as possible? Right? So he said one easy place to start is to find the vertical distance between each point and the model. So this line represents the model itself. Can we find what that vertical distance is going to be? As seen in the following diagram, right? So he said, note that I have shifted the X values slightly so you can view the individual distances. So at least you can see what each of the distance of the line of the points to the line looks like. So the distance is the difference between this, the Y value given by the model, which is the prediction, and the actual Y value in the data. So the way we we'll probably represent this statistically will be like Y, and that why that has a hat on it. I forget what that hat is, but that's probably what you kind of represent the statistic. Um, to compute this distance, we first turn our model into a, an R function, right? And um, this, this 
take the model parameters and the data as inputs and give values predicted by the model as an output. So the, the y hat itself. Right? So for us to represent this model family to our function, we run it. The first thing is we create this function called model one, going to a function create a data um, from, from, from the information that we, we've had here. Um, uh, uh, then we put a simplified equation here. So a1 plus data um, x uh, multiplied by a2. Right. So if I run this, uh, if I quickly run this, it will give me a series of numbers. Right. So next, we need some way to compute an overall distance between the predicted and actual values. Right. In other words, the plot shows 30 distances, what is represented here. How do we collapse that into a simple number, into a single number? One common way to do this statistics is uh, what we call a root mean squared deviation. So when you are doing your you know, regression analysis, the R squared um, that you know is kind of like a part of the equation that, that is given itself. So this again, this chapter analysis. So if you have any kind of background regression analysis, I think this chapter will be a lot more friendly um, than other chapters that we've kind of walked through uh, in the book itself. Um, so we compute the difference between the actual and predicted. We square them, we average them, and take the square roots. That's how you get this root mean square division. This distance has a lot of appealing mathematical properties, and we'll kind of touch on this itself. I think it's currently a class that's doing um, introduction to statistical learning with R. And you know, one of the things that they talk about in that class, it's it's heavily related to regression analysis itself. So if you guys have any chance of checking out that class, I think it's it's, it's a very, very interesting class to actually take after you finish this entire book. So, so this distance itself has a lot of appealing mathematical properties, but we're not going to touch on it here, which is why I kind of referenced you guys to that class itself. Um, and you can take his word for it. <laughs> so so let, let's, let's, create, let's create a function to try to see how we can measure that distance again. So everything we are trying to do here is, we have a regression equation that we are working with here. We're just trying to represent it in R itself. So let's, let's now measure that distance. So I create this function, uh, this variable called measure distance, run it through a function, uh, mode data um, diff, um, the difference. Um, uh, data taking the colon y, colon y, I minus the uh, this model one. So what I've created here, um, uh, I square it. Uh, I, I take the mean and I do square it, right? Now, if I, if I, if I now run this function that I've created with the two parameters that I have, it gives me 2.67. Right. So now we can use per to compute the distance for all models defined previously. Right. So we need an helper function because our distance function has a numeric vector of minus two. So things start getting interesting from here on. Um, so first, I create a variable, same one distance. I use a function a1, a2. Um, continue with my measure distance function I created. I, I run it through this um, a1, a2, and I put same one. I now create models. Um, uh, models, I run it through a pipe, mutate distance is equal to four, um, map to the, um, the database itself, a1, a2, same one, this same one distribution. Then I now run these models. It will create a table for me that has um, 250 rows columns right so if you literally put this in like a mathematical set for me to kind of work through right so the next step is now to overlay the 10 best models onto the data and we can color code it right and we said we've color coded this color the model by using this right so he said this is an easy way to make sure that this moves with the smallest distance again going back to how we have described what we think a good model should be Right. The best way to do this is um, uh, 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 the easy, this is an easy way to make sure that the best models, that is the ones with the smallest distance, get the brightest color. Right. So now let's visualize everything that we're we'll trying to work through. All we have been trying to do here is a measure the distance. B that we try to get a good model itself. So from this scattered graph that we have here, we feel that we have gotten to a so we run that through a ggplot, uh, the same one data set. 
select the x and y variables g on points the point of this the point is size 2 the color is gray right then we do the same ga geom ab line that we've been doing just to get this line itself and run that through the aes and then we set an intercept we set a slope then we color it by minus distance what this is going to represent right then we now put data function filter models and we rank less than or equal to 10. right we'll see what this actually means as we get into the book itself so he said we can also think about models as observations i think it's kind of like an easier way to kind of um uh think about it itself uh because like as soon as i have a a, a simple line that has an entire linear equation itself it's kind of easy for me to make a judgment call for what that is and that is what i would probably call an observation so instead of using the term family of models we can think of this as observations because i think that's a lot of the and we can now visualize them with the scatter plot everything that we've been trying to do so far again colored by negative disks we can no longer directly see how the model compares to the data but we can see many models at once similar to how we have created this uh, itself so now at least we can see different models different lines with different gradients and different intercepts and now they're actually playing out together the extra thing we can actually do is apart from the lines itself we put all the models together in a graph and you can now see them as scatter plots itself right so simple way to do that is our simple ggplot i will run through this code itself because i think it's self-explanatory uh, to create a scatter plot to use gm points uh, then we can set a color to be this negative distance that we have created right um then he now says instead of trying lots of random models we can be a bit more structured um, and generate an evenly spaced grid of plots right so this is called a grid search right so what the book did is he picked parameters of the grid roughly by looking at where the best models were in the preceding plot. And again, this is why I also said that, you know, visualization kind of plays a role here. You can heavily depend on mathematical models, but sometimes it's kind of easy for you to kind of visualize it. So you can see, at least you can easily pick out what your best representation might look like to you, right? So for us to achieve this grid search, we run through a pool of code here. Let me just run through this code um, one by one. One, I create a variable called grid, run it through expand grid, um, set my A1 to a sequence between negative 5 um, and 20 with length 25, um, and sequence 1 to 3, length 25. I pipe this through the mutate function, distance equals to 4, um, similar to everything we'll be doing above, map 2 underscore DBL, A1, A2, sim, sim 1 distance. So these are all data sets or variables that I've created from where we are coming. Um, I run this grid through a pipe ggplot um, AES A1, A1, A2. Um, it creates a geom point. We're trying to visualize this itself. Um, data, I filter this for the grid search. I rank it by negative, sorry, by less than or equal to 10. We size this so I can see it bigger and I can color it red. Um, I run this geom point also by um, AES, um, color of this negative distance. All right, so you can see that as you go from left to right, you can see what that color looks like because of what you have set here. All right, so I think I'll soon come to the end of the chapter where I stopped. It, uh, um, so where, where, when you overlay the best 10 models, um, back on your data, they look pretty good, right? Okay, and maybe just go back to where we are coming from. So this, this is where we're coming from. This is what we thought the model kind of looks like. And we now decided to represent 250 data points just to create a scattered model and kind of explain the idea of a good model itself, right? So now, now I've gotten to the end of the exercise. And what we are now trying to do is, can I overlay the best 10 models that I've, I've been able to generate uh, based on that original data itself, right? So I will run through this code. Well, you can see how self-explanatory everything is. Now, the idea of the good model here is they are now pretty close to what that line now represents. Right? Uh, let me see where I stopped. I think I stopped just before this exercise. So I'm sure I'm also finished. Um, the, 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 the remaining part of, of where I read is, again, like I said, this, this chapter is heavily dependent on like regression analysis stop process uh, itself and scatter plots and things like that. So the remaining part of this is just um, uh, some thought process around you know linear regression analysis itself. Right? So, 
Um, so I said, um, so let me let me go back here. So you can imagine iteratively making the grid finer and finer until you have narrowed in on what one best model looks like. But there is a better way to tackle that problem. It's a, a numerical minimization tool called Newton Wraps and Search. And I, I did a bit of digging in on this. I'll send you guys like a, an article um, that, that, I, that I have on this at the end of when I, when I finish. So the, the intuition of Newton Rapson is pretty simple. You pick a starting point and you look around for the steepest slope. You can ski down that slope a little way, then repeat again and again until you can't go any lower. In R, you can do this Newton Rapson's with, with a function called Optin. It actually gets into the details of Optin, I guess much later in the book itself. Um, you know, but don't bother yourself what Optin represents, just kind of understand what the code is trying to do itself. So A, I create a variable, I run Optin um, through um, COO, measure the distance. So these are all you know, values that we've created. Uh, data is in one. Uh, best, I pick a particular colon, uh, and I have a representation of 4.2 and 2.05. I run this entire thing through a ggplot. So ggplot is in one. Select my x and y variable. Um, I use a ggplot, uh, use size two, color it gray, and I also use my ab line, the intercept here. So everything I created here, I subset one in that, and I create my slope and I subset two. And this is kind of what is likely going to represent, right? So it says here, yeah, don't worry too much about the details of this opt-in. It is the intuition that is quite important, right? So if you have a function that defines the distance between and an algorithm that minimizes that distance by modifying the parameters of the model, you can find the best, best model. So everything that we're working through um, is to get to this point itself um, uh, before we go to the other part of the book. All we are trying to do is we have a data set. We, we have created an assumed model, right? And we've walked through how to get through that assumed model, assuming that you have 250 models itself. The next thing is you can now define an algorithm using this function and help you to minimize that distance itself by modifying the parameters of the model so that you can get to what your best fit would probably be, right? The neat thing about this approach is that it will work for any family of models that you can write an equation for, right? There's one more approach you can use for this model because it's a special case of a broader family called linear models. A linear model, similar to how we have been speaking about it, is a form of um, there is no power or any you know, kind of um, gradient that is, that is overlaid here. It's all in single, singular power form. I think that's what this equation is trying to represent. So this simple model is equivalent to a general linear model where n equal when n is two and x underscore one is x. So R R as a tool specifically designed for fitting more linear models called LM, a special way to specify the model family formulas. Formulas looks like this, right? Which LM will translate into a function of so this y i think it's called a tilde sign x is now going to be like a linear equation itself formulated as y equals your intercept plus the gradient multiplied by x right and we can fit this model and look at the output so let's see what this ln tries to do so i create this in one underscore mode x and my data is in one right then try to get the coefficient itself this a a1 becomes this 4.2 and my x um, is um, uh, 2.05, right? So he said these are not exactly the same values we got with Optin. Behind the scenes, LM doesn't use Optin, but instead takes advantage of the mathematical structure of linear models, right? So using some connections between geometric clause and linear algebra, LM actually finds uh, the closest model in a single step using a sophisticated algorithm this approach is faster and guarantees that there is a global minimum. So I, I will stop here. I, I will start from this. Uh, let me just put a note here. So I will start from the exercises itself on the next 
class. But I guess so far so good. Everything we have done is just pure introductions itself to model uh, itself. Or like I said, the broader picture of what this chapter tries to represent is a lot more linear in regression analysis terms. Um, so if you have any familiarity with linear with regression analysis itself, I think the chapter will kind of be a bit more a bit more friendly to you guys. So like I said, I think we're going to finish before the time itself. Um, but this is kind of where I, I kind of understood the entire chapter too. Perfect. So, so I, I said I was going to share um, this new team Ramsey search. Um, you know, let me, let me just, let me pull it up for my drive. And I guess we could um, we could call it today. So I actually found a PDF. I don't know if I put a PDF into this. Um, uh, yeah, pop, perhaps, perhaps you can drop our emails. I don't know. Yeah, I'll just send the link. I guess. So oh, okay. Just put the link. So if, if I give you the link, I think I think it's a uh, it's a full ground. The, uh, I'm gonna the go PDF, so. So, Thank you guys very much for your time. And again, apologies for not going into detail in the in the chapter itself. No, oh, that, that's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for the link too, Daniel. And no yeah. worries about not finishing. It's a long chapter, so better exactly. to take it easy. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, guys. All the best. Yeah. All right.